and close again as fast. <laughs> Nature here, one sailor wrote, is like a living malevolent beast. This ice maze stretches for a thousand miles across the Canadian Arctic, and finding a route across it, the fabled Northwest Passage, was the holy grail of exploration for more than 400 years. But of all the hundreds of attempts, two are legends in themselves. The first, led by Sir John Franklin, was the climax of Victorian Britain's passion for conquest, as arrogant and heroic as any expedition in history. The second, led by the Norwegian Roel Amundsen, was a penniless venture in a tiny second-hand fishing boat. But so revolutionary, it tore up the rule book of exploration. Both men would pay a devastating price in their battle with the ice maze. In the spring of 1845, the largest and most lavishly supplied expedition ever to sail in search of the Northwest Passage headed towards the Arctic, certain that this prize was theirs for the taking. But the fate of this expedition was to become one of the most enduring mysteries of British history. It was last sighted heading for the ice. Then the two ships and 129 men simply vanished off the face of the earth. More than 40 search expeditions scoured the Arctic in the decade that followed, but no survivors were ever found, nor any trace of their ships. Only now, more than 150 years later, has a group of scientists and historians uncovered an extraordinary new trail of clues. It's really one of the most remarkable bodies of evidence we have from eyewitnesses who actually saw what happened. I think this evidence is strongly suggestive of cannibalism among these Franklin crew members. It was a feeling of shock, really, or amazement that these sailors from the last century, there they were. Based on this evidence, these experts will try to reconstruct the last journey of Franklin and his men. The search for the Northwest Passage dated back to the 16th century. Some of the greatest names in exploration, men like Hudson and Frobisher, each tried and failed to find a route through the ice. The dream they were chasing was a trade route that would link Europe and Asia, not by the long route round the Horn, but by sailing a ship across the Arctic. The problem was just that it was probably the most dangerous shortcut in the world. The Arctic is an archipelago of islands with ice in between, and the ice is constantly moving. It's a puzzle, it's a matrix, it's like a maze. The winds are blowing the ice around, the currents are pushing the ice. And for a ship to traverse that was next to impossible. The ice flows are grinding together. They would open up and make a nice open water lead and a ship would sail down it. And suddenly the, the, the wind shifts, the ice closes in on them and they're trapped. They can't go backwards, they can't go forwards. For 300 years, the ice defeated every challenger. But then in 1845, a nation that had conquered half the globe refused to accept that this stubborn piece of wilderness could defeat them. A new British voyage in search of the passage was announced under the command of Sir John Franklin, a 59-year-old former polar explorer, hoping for one last shot at glory before retirement. His expedition was to be the best funded and best equipped in the history of the passage. A showcase of the Victorians' ability to master nature with technology. They're not doing this in a threadbare way. They're doing this in the most abundant, well-provisioned, lavish, confident, mid-Victorian way that you could possibly imagine. Franklin's ships, the Erebus and the Terror, were supplied with the very latest inventions. 
tin cans to keep their meat supplies fresh, boilers to heat their cabins, iron plates to protect their hulls, and 15-ton locomotive engines to part even the thickest ice. You can sense the extraordinary confidence of people who'd pushed back the frontiers of nature through the glories of the Industrial Revolution, this might that they suddenly had at their disposal. And so they built up this force and two great ships reinforced by steel, and this would be their fortress. As the ships set sail, the Times reported, with all the advantages of modern science, the expedition may be attended with great results. The possibility of failure was barely discussed. In the 40 years before the Franklin expedition, they haven't had a disaster yet. They've come very close to disaster, but almost dying has a nasty habit of, of actually confirming you in your ways. It makes you proud of yourself for having survived. A month later, the ships stopped at Greenland to load final supplies. Though Franklin hoped to make it across the Arctic that summer, he was equipped to spend three winters in the ice. And that was the sting to the passage. Explorers not only had to navigate a thousand-mile labyrinth of ice and land, they had to do it against the clock. In the three short months of summer, when channels opened through the ice. See, you're writing to that woman of yours again, James. No, I'm writing to my brother's wife. Ah, of course. I seem to have touched a nerve. On board the ships, Franklin seemed to inspire both trust and devotion. Yeah, I touched. James Fitzjames, a young officer on the Erebus, was on his first voyage to the Arctic. You have no idea how happy we all feel. We are very fond of Sir John. He is anything but nervous and fidgety. He is full of life and energy and kindness. We will toast his health when we reach the other side. Everyone believes we will make it through in a season, though I hope that we are forced to stay at least one winter in the ice. But not everyone shared this confidence. Francis Crozier, the expedition's second in command, saw aspects of Franklin that made him distinctly nervous. All goes smoothly, but I am sad and alone. I don't have a soul in either ship that I can go and talk to. No congenial spirit, as it were. Franklin is very decided in his own views, but has not got good judgment. I fear we will blunder into the ice. On the 28th of July, 1845, the expedition passed a British whaling ship as they headed for the ice. The captain reported the men were in remarkable spirits, expecting to finish the operation in good time. It was the last undisputed sighting of Franklin and his men alive. Something happened to that expedition within the ice maze. Something that seemed to pluck them from the face of the earth. How could the largest and best equipped expedition in Arctic history simply disappear? It is a mystery that's become an obsession for men like historian Russell Potter. Potter has come to the Arctic on the trail of clues that might reconstruct the path of the expedition. Over the past 150 years, the snow and ice have gradually given up fragments of evidence, and the first are here, near the Inuit settlement of Resolute. It's one of the most tremendously haunting stories, maybe the greatest unsolved mystery of the 19th century. Two ships, 129 men, where have they gone? Uh, there's evidence scattered almost all over this map. 
Uh, you have some graves here, a whaleboat here, skeletons on the beach here. So it's about as close as you can get to the feeling of actually being in the past of the Franklin Expedition. The first clue to the route Franklin took when he reached the ice lies at a site four hours skidoo ride north of Resolute. It was evidence of a winter camp and it was first discovered five years after the expedition disappeared. The searchers found the first traces of the Franklin expedition here on Beachy Island. They found signs that tents had been erected, uh, a place where a smithy or anvil had been set up, uh, even some attempt to build a garden up on the shingle. But the most telling relics of all were the graves of three of Franklin's young sailors. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Sitting here with these graves, uh, we know they were here. It's just a very, very haunting and, and haunted place. The camp at Beachy Island was 300 miles into the Arctic ice and was proof at least that Franklin and his men had survived their first taste of the most inhospitable terrain on Earth. It was magical in a terrifying way. It was as big a thing for them as it would be for us to send somebody now to walk on Mars. It was that unsupported. It was that much at the, the far limit of what human beings could do. As the dark of Arctic winter set in, the expedition must have sought the shelter of Beachy Island. There, they were perfectly equipped to spend their first winter frozen in the ice. They had a library of 3,000 books, heated cabins, even provisions supplied by Fortnum and Mason. They were clutching their civilization closely around them, and they thought it made them safe. They thought that was all they would need. There was a whole mentality, a siege mentality. The ship was there to keep out all the elements, and as long as that ship maintained itself, as long as they cut off the outside world, they would be absolutely fine. But for such a well-equipped expedition, the evidence at Beachy was also troubling. Why did three young sailors die so soon after leaving England? And why, beside the graves, were hundreds of empty tin food cans? piled into a tower with no message or explanation. It was strict naval protocol to leave a written document of some kind uh, at every location, but no matter where they looked here on Beachy, there was nothing. They found other signs, though, that may point to a hasty departure. There was a pair of cashmere gloves left drying on a rock, uh, bits and pieces of things as if people had left in a hurry. Uh, but the only sign was a, a boarding pike had been left on the beach with a pointing hand painted on a board nailed to it. Where it pointed, nobody was quite sure. The winter camp at Beachy was a tantalizing first discovery, but it offered a glimpse of the expedition and nothing more. No one knew where Franklin's men had gone from there. John Stewart is a different kind of newsreader. Who are you? The good guy's name is Amin. Is Kong a girl or a guy in the Do they have the license to kill or do they take that back? <laughs> Why do you work harder than our actual president? I'll be right back. The Daily Show. All the news you'll ever need weekdays at 8.30 on More 4. Nice car, mate. Take a look at the stunning new Astra. Go drive. I'm angry with my mum for doing this. 
I know that I know that she didn't ask for cancer and she doesn't she doesn't deserve it. But if she hadn't have smoked, we wouldn't have to be doing this. More than anything, I, I feel like I've let my children down. It's the gamble. I took it and I've lost. For help giving up, call 0800 169 0169. Some think startup. We think IPO. Some think competition. We think partnership. Some think successful business. We think wealth protection. Whatever your vision, we at Credit Suisse seek new perspectives to make it a reality. In 1953, one family survived a nuclear explosion. The government abandoned them. The testing changed them. But what didn't kill them only made them deadlier. Where's Mama? Mister, would you pay with us? The hills have eyes. To maintain a healthy heart, Flora Proactive have a new mini drink that contains active dairy peptides proven to help control blood pressure. MFI best sale must end on March the 8th. It's your last chance to get up to half price plus an extra 30% off everything in store at MFI. Giving up smoking was a bit of a family affair because I went with my brother and my sister. I was worried that people in my local NHS stop smoking service wouldn't understand how hard it is to give up, but really they were lovely. They really did help me get through the toughest moments and I quit about six months ago. For details of your local service, call 0800 169 0169. Hurry down to your local Vauxhall retailer, where the Astra SXI is now available with no deposit, 0% finance and free insurance. After the discovery of Franklin's winter camp, the trail of the missing expedition went cold, until the next clue was discovered in 1859. 14 years after the expedition disappeared. It was found 350 miles south of the winter camp at Beachy, on the northern tip of King William Island. Pulled from a tower of stones, it was an expedition log sealed inside a metal canister. The evidence we have it's a small record piece of admiralty paper uh, in a metal cylinder inside a cairn. It began with the standard admiralty form, the message, all well, Sir John Franklin commanding. The expedition log reported that in the autumn of 1846, just months after leaving Beachy Island, the ships were trapped in ice. But around that message on the margins was written a second, far more disturbing message. Scribbled in the margin two years later, this message said the ships were still trapped and now they were being deserted. It was the only piece of written evidence ever found and it provided vital clues. First, it revealed where Franklin's ship sailed from Beachy. Just as he was instructed, Franklin sailed south towards an area uncharted on his map. And from there, down an unmarked channel known today as Peel Sound. Now, Peel Sound heads straight south. To Franklin, 
that would have been a very, very tempting route to take, particularly if it was open, free of ice. And Peel Sound, we know today, is very, very changeable from year to year. One year it can be completely wide open, another year it can be choked up with ice so that it's impassable even by modern ships. But if this channel was a tempting route, it was also a dangerous one. No previous expedition had ever reported Peel Sound to be navigable. How is the current? Anything from Ross? Anything in Parry? Franklin had already broken naval protocol by failing to leave a note at Beachy Island. Now, he was ordering his ships down a channel the Admiralty assumed was impassable. On HMS Terror, his second in command, Francis Crozier, must have mulled the letter he'd written from Greenland. Franklin is very decided in his own views, but has not got good judgment. I fear we will blunder into the ice. In the summer of 1846, Franklin led his ships into Peel Sound. And may God protect us. First, it seemed they made good progress, traveling 300 miles south to where the expedition log was found. But there, at the bottom of Peel Sound, the ice closed in. In the log, it documented the nightmare that then unfolded. They were trapped in the ice at the same position not just for the winter of 1846, but all through the spring and summer of 1847, waiting in vain for the ice to break up. The nightmare scenario is that I'm never gonna get out of this ice. I'm facing another long winter. It's gonna get dark, it's gonna get very cold. And here I am out on the ice that's still moving around. I don't know where this ice is carrying me. Something terrifying was unfolding that summer. Something that undermined every aspect of their plan. The ice wasn't melting. Back in the town of Resolute, this odd aspect of the mystery sparked the curiosity of a polar ice scientist. Roy Kerner knew that if he could unravel the weather conditions Franklin encountered, it might solve this piece of the puzzle. But first, he needed ice preserved from the mid-19th century. Out on the Arctic ice cap, his team drilled for an ice core that by its depth, they could date to the 1840s. And then Kerner began looking for clues. The reason ice cores give the history of the climate in the past is that everything that happens on the surface is preserved as the ice gets buried. If the surface of the snow melts, the water percolates down and it forms these ice layers. The more it melts, the more ice layers and the thicker the ice layers. But on the Franklin ice core, there was simply no sign of the transparent ice layers that showed the snow was melting. The point to make on this core is the absolute near absence of any signs of melting whatsoever. None of those clear layers at all. Um, just bubbly ice that is formed from compression of snow that doesn't melt in the summer. Kerner had once seen another ice core with this little evidence of summer melting back in the early 1970s. Then his records revealed a very cold period of almost permanent winter when much of the sea ice simply didn't melt at all. It convinced him that Franklin had collided with the most dangerous ice conditions imaginable. If it's a cold summer, that ice isn't going to go out and open up. The channels are ice infested still. Some modern icebreakers can plow through quite thick ice, 
without even stopping. But if, if you're talking the ships that they used in those days, it's a totally different situation. They don't have the power to get through even uh, modest ice. Kerner's evidence explained why the ships weren't released in the summer of 1847. But worse, suggested this cold period might have lasted as many as five years. And just as the men began to realize their predicament, something else happened. The expedition log contained a second devastating message. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847. The total loss by death in the expedition has been to this date, nine officers and 15 men. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul melteth away because of trouble. They reel to and fro, but stagger like a drunken man. It's clear from everything we know he was a beloved commander. Then they He'd been in the Arctic before and only one other officer had. And he bringeth them out. I think that his presence was a tremendous reassurance to everyone there and his loss would have been a, a terrific blow. So that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they are quiet. So he bringeth them unto the haven where they would be. In the year Franklin died, his wife, Lady Jane, felt a strange sense of foreboding. Unaware that she was already a widow, she wrote a series of letters to her missing husband. I desire nothing but to cherish the remainder of your days, however injured and broken your health may be. I live in you, my dearest. Franklin and 23 of his men died just two years into one of the best supplied expeditions in Arctic history. But why was one of the biggest mysteries of all. We don't know what it was that was killing them. It's a huge loss, unparalleled in any other expedition of this kind. Terrific casualties, and yet the note doesn't tell us what, what was killing them. The first clue to what might be causing the deaths wasn't discovered until 1984, when the Canadian government gave permission for a team of forensic scientists to exhume the graves of the three sailors buried at Beachy Island. At Beachy Island, you have the remains of three members of the expedition and almost certainly preserved remains, so that this, this opens po the possibility of, of understanding the medical reasons behind the disaster. The team believed the corpses would lie preserved in the ice, but nothing prepared them for what they uncovered. It was such a profoundly moving experience, and also one of shock, really, or amazement, that these sailors from the last century, there they were, you could, you could see their eyelashes, you could see their eye color, you could even get a sense, almost, of the personality of these characters. After the autopsy in the Arctic, the bodies of the Franklin sailors were reburied, and the team returned to their laboratory in Canada to continue the investigation. It was there, as they began to run forensic tests on the sailors' hair and soft tissue, that they discovered something intriguing. Levels of lead six to 10 times normal, enough to cause severe lead poisoning. But what had caused it? The question drew the scientists back to another of the clues at Beachy Island, the Tower of Tin Food Cans. When they tested the lead in the soldering of the cans, it matched the lead found in the bodies. It's like a fingerprint uh, that was found in the bodies, in the organs, in the tissues, in the bone uh, that was also found in the solder 
fire. It came from the tin food supply, and th that was the smoking gun. Not everyone was convinced. Some scientists argued the lead levels could have been caused by the industrial pollution of Victorian Britain. But then in the 1990s, a Canadian anthropologist decided to test the evidence from a new angle. Using a process called X-ray fluorescence, she discovered the indications of lead were much higher in soft, spongy bones like the vertebrae than any other bones in the body. It was a vital clue, because soft bones virtually regenerate themselves every few years. These individuals were exposed to this lead over a fairly recent period of time before their death. So this was short-term exposure from some source on the expedition. Above all, Keenly Side's tests confirmed the extraordinary levels of lead in the bodies. They were so high that these individuals would have almost certainly been suffering from serious physiological and neurological problems. The symptoms would include fatigue, confusion, and paranoia. In itself, the lead might not kill the men, but if they were sick already, it could. The surgeons might never have guessed, though, that their ingenious tin food supply was the very thing poisoning the men. Suddenly you have a picture that suggests that the technology that Franklin had hoped to see them through uh, actually played a role in their destructions. There was something that was undermining the, the health of the crews. With men sickening, the ships trapped, their commander dead, and supplies running low, the crew's situation was growing desperate. The expedition log gave one last clue as to what happened next. It said 105 men were deserting the ships and making for a place called Baxfish River. But Baxfish River was the other side of a channel they might need boats to cross. And after that, it was a further 90 miles to the river. By any standard, it was a momentous decision. They were abandoning the shelter and safety of the ships for the Arctic wilderness around them. Given the shortage of provisions uh, and the circumstances of the ships, it was probably an unavoidable choice. The ship is a kind of a womb, it's a kind of a place of safety, but eventually your refuge is, is going to be your tomb. The expedition log was signed by the officer now in command, Francis Crozier the man who feared Franklin would blunder into the ice. But if Crozier judged Franklin, he now faced an even bigger test himself. The ships were stranded 600 miles from the nearest civilization, and no one at the Admiralty had ever anticipated that the men would need to travel by foot across the harshest landscape on Earth. the search party that found the expedition log also came across an abandoned boat. Together with its heavy oak sled, the boat weighed 1,400 pounds. But it was what was inside that shocked the searchers most. This boatload of strange relics of Victorian culture. The Vicar of Wakefield prayer books, a New Testament in French, carpet slippers, chocolate, tea, button polishers, buttons, silver plate and utensils, all of the detritus of this, you know, uh, inner culture of the ships that they tried to take with them. I can imagine these people desperately wanting to carry their precious world with them, but everything they trusted was now going to become not an advantage, but a problem. So that they were burdened now by their numbers, they were burdened now by the weight of their stores, and above all, burdened by the fact that they didn't know what to do with the land that they were now suddenly totally dependent on. The expedition log said 105 men started walking south in May 1848. After that, the clues ran dry. No other messages were ever discovered. But there was just one last lead. The possibility that out in the Arctic, 
there were eyewitnesses who'd seen these men alive. Jeff, Jeff, I've got it. We'll beat your insurance deal. I'll give you 50 pounds. If it's cheaper, we'll drop our price and give you 50 pounds. Kiss. No kiss. We're so confident we'll beat your home insurance renewal that if it's cheaper, we'll drop our price. Hello. And give you 50 pounds when you switch. <laughs> insurance from Barclays. Now there's a thought. They say the Yorkers can be demanding. But if an expectation that things be done quickly and to a certain level of perfection is demanding, well then, yeah, we're demanding. You can't drive it, park it! He's a pussycat, really. We just have a highly developed sense of what we want out of life. You're flying American, right? Absolutely. We've flown more New Yorkers to destinations around the world than any other airline. And if we can keep them happy... Five resorts, apartments and villas with all the luxury you can possibly desire from £85,000. All with the benefit of Polaris World, one of Spain's most prestigious property developments. Here in Murcia, right next to some of the best beaches in Spain. So if you're considering buying a house in Spain, don't forget, visit Polaris World. Maybe tomorrow, better today. Luxury Spanish Properties by Polaris World. Samsung salute to the Olympic Games. Hell yeah, you will. Neil Diamond. You're gonna be okay. Twelve songs. You might get lost, but then you'll find a way. Now is the time. The most talked about Let album of the year. Finally know that I'm so on to you. All we know is that we couldn't get enough. Neil Diamond. 12 songs, out now. Yeah, no, that, that sounds perfect for me, yeah. For careers advice that's tailored to fit you, call the Learn Direct advice line on 0800 100 900. For more than a century, it was assumed that the Franklin survivors who deserted the ships in 1848 died of sickness and starvation on their journey south that year. But that ignored one fascinating possibility, that there were eyewitnesses in the Arctic to the fate of these men. Hidden in the Washington archive for more than a hundred years were detailed accounts of Inuit people encountering Franklin's men. The testimony, studied by Russell Potter, was given to an explorer called Francis Hall in the 1860s but it was discarded because the Victorians believed the Inuit were ignorant savages. I, I think that the evidence he brought back was just evidence people did not want to hear. I mean, for more than a century, people ignored that evidence. The vague babble of savages, they called it. Inuit testimony couldn't be trustworthy. They couldn't have known. But he was incredibly diligent. He went and lived among them. He gathered information carefully. He asked people again and again the same questions, corroborated the testimony. 
It's really one of the most remarkable bodies of evidence we have from eyewitnesses who actually saw what happened. The first intriguing clue amongst the Inuit evidence told of an abandoned camp on King William Island. The story recurred of a camp, uh, a tent place, as Hall called it, uh, where there was some sign of a permanent camp. There were bodies, there was equipment. The Inuit had been there and brought things out of it. And eventually, he had eyewitnesses who had been there, who had seen the tent. The presence of a camp, where men had spent some time, suggested that something had brought the expedition's journey south to a halt that summer. In the expedition log, Crozier said they were making for Baxfish River, a 250-mile journey south. But this camp, found by the Inuit, was barely 80 miles south of the ships. No one knows where they might have abandoned the journey south. But it's possible the sickness amongst the men was getting worse. And that three years into their Arctic journey, a new factor was at work. Scurvy. The expedition was issued lemon juice to stave off the disease. But vitamin C is highly unstable. As early as a year into their journey, their supplies were probably useless. The first symptoms of scurvy are a sort of a general lassitude and a weakness. And it mainly affects the gums. They become swollen, they become purple. The slightest touch means they bleed very, very easily. As it develops, the bleeding goes on everywhere. You can get bleeding into your eyes, you get bleeding into your muscles, and this is particularly painful. The main uh, muscle that you're using to try and pull this sledge through the snow, and you've got this agonizing bleeding into, into the muscles and into the joints, so it would have just slowly but horrendously killed them. When you combine lead and scurvy, you, you suddenly have this tag team uh, undermining the, the health of, of the crewmen. It really was a recipe for a mass disaster. As the winter of 1848 approached, Crozier and his second in command, James FitzJames, the young officer on his first voyage to the Arctic, must have realized their chances of walking off the island were gone. There was just one tentative clue to the decision they made. When the search party found the boat full of possessions abandoned, one of the searchers noticed a strange detail. Having surveyed the site, he notices the boat, and it is actually pointed in what seems to him the wrong direction. It's not going away from where the ships were abandoned, it's going back. These were not people who were uh, going somewhere in expectation of release. They were, they were retreating back to the only home that they knew and trying desperately to get there. Franklin's men were now facing their fourth winter in the Arctic. As they retreated back to the ships that autumn of 1848, the first British Admiralty search party was making its way into the Arctic. That winter, it even sent a sledging party right to the mouth of Peel Sound, the very channel south that Franklin's ships had sailed down. When the searchers came looking for him, they looked down Peel Sound and saw nothing but an impassable barrier of ice. Just assumed, I guess, that Peel Sound was always choked with ice. It never opened up. That Franklin never would have gone down there. The search party moved on and reported Franklin must have gone another way. Just 300 miles to the south, Franklin's men, back in the shelter of their ships, must have believed their chances of rescue were fading. If they were going to get out, it would have to be on their own. Buried in the Washington archives, there was now an Inuit report of some of Franklin's men trying for a second time to walk to safety. Two elderly Inuit called Takita and Oa described the encounter to explorer Charles Hall. They said the year was 1850 and that the men were led by an officer. <laughs> We were out sealing when we saw something on the ice. As they drew nearer, we realized it was white men. 
they asked us for food. Can you help us? We, we need food. Yes, we, we're very hungry, yes? The food. officer also signaled that two ships lay in the we ice to the ships. north. Ships? Then he made a They're motion of falling sideways, whistling They're and blowing. Ice. It was the sound of a ship being crushed in the ice. The Inuit said they gave the men some seal meat, which they took back to their tents. They also said the men only seemed able to shoot small birds. They needed food because they didn't know how to catch seals or hunt caribou. Early next morning, we set off. The leader tried to make us stop, but we were in a hurry and did not know the men were starving. Stop! 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 Inuit simply packed up and left. But when you think about it, a group of 30 white men, uh, all hungry, emaciated, starving, unable to hunt for themselves, unable to move quickly, uh, and a small band of Inuit, maybe only two or three hunters. There's no way they could have kept that large group alive. And if they had tried, it probably would have resulted in the death of both groups. The story of what happened to those men is told in a trail of remains discovered over the years along the south coast of King William Island. At first they managed to bury their dead in makeshift graves, but then, weakened by coldness and hunger, they simply died where they fell. The bodies scattered at intervals for 30 miles. <coughs> In the Arctic, you feel like the elements are not passive. You feel like you're involved in some malevolent force. When you experience extreme cold for the first time, it's like a glove closing around you. You feel like you don't want to fight. You want to give in. You want to close down your senses. After a time, it's almost as if the cold has seeped through to your heart. And I don't mean your physical heart, I mean your soul, your very being, because you feel like no longer fighting. And once you've given up that fight, and you just want to sleep, you just want to become part of that oblivion. to the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distress. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they are quiet. trying to reach help, told the Inuit that one of their ships had been crushed in the ice. That same year, the Inuit described an incident that took place on a single ship trapped in the ice. And this was the most disturbing story of all, an account of one last group of survivors. <laughs> An elderly woman reported that a man from her village came upon a ship with a camp on land nearby. 
The Inuit went to the ship all alone. He said there were men there. He said they had black faces, black hands, black clothes on, were black all over. This Inuit was very alarmed because they would not let him get away. Then a captain came out of the cabin and put a stop to it. Leave him! Then the captain took this Inuit down with him into his cabin. There is a tent. He told him to look over to the land where there are men living in a big tent. He said neither the Inuit nor any of his people must ever go there. Understand. You must not go there. You must go. 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 Do not come here. The Inuit was never told why some men were living separately in a forbidden camp. But in 1994, bone fragments discovered on King William Island suggested one chilling possibility. When anthropologist Anne Keenleyside tested the bones for lead poisoning, she also examined them under a powerful electron microscope. We saw very distinct cut marks. These were quite different from animal tooth marks. These looked like very definite cut marks, as if they were made by a, some kind of a knife or metal blade. Keenly side then began plotting the pattern of cut marks on a skeleton. A lot of the cuts were located in the vicinity of the joints. Some of the bones that would have been covered by a lot of flesh or soft tissue. We also found cuts, interestingly, in the bones of the hands and feet. And the hands and feet are very, probably the most human aspects of the body apart from the face. And the fact that we were finding cuts in those locations suggested to me that perhaps these individuals were intentionally removing those more human aspects of the body. I think this evidence is strongly suggestive of cannibalism among these Franklin crew members. I don't see any other possible explanation that would account for those cut marks. Keenly Side's tests collaborated the Inuit evidence, a century and a half old. The bones she tested were discovered in almost exactly the spot the Inuit described in the story of the black men. What became of these survivors is uncertain. Some years later, the Inuit reported finding an empty ship. Close by was some footprints, but nothing else. That appeared to be the end of the Franklin story. But for one last intriguing detail. In about 1851, an Inuit hunter found four white men half dead on the ice and sheltered them for the winter. When the spring came, they gave him an officer's sword as a gesture of thanks. It was made in 1835, the year James Fitzjames was made lieutenant. Everyone believes we will make it through in a season, though I hope that we are forced to stay at least one winter in the ice. When the Inuit found them, the men had been in the Arctic for six years. They were last seen heading for home. Piece by piece through the 1850s, news of the relics uncovered by the search parties made its way back to Britain.
In 1859, with the discovery of the note on King William Island, the search was officially called off. When its details were disclosed, Lady Franklin learned she'd been a widow for more than a decade. But still, she demanded the search for an answer to the mystery go on. What secrets may be hidden within those wrecked or stranded ships, we know not. What may be buried in the graves of our unhappy countrymen, or in caches not yet discovered, we have yet to learn. And thus left in ignorance and darkness, with so little obtained. Can it be fitting to pronounce that the fate of the expedition has been ascertained? For years, historians and scientists have searched for clues to the fate of the Franklin expedition. And at last, their evidence taken together offers a plausible answer to this enduring mystery. After sailing south through Peel Sound, Franklin's men became trapped in the ice off King William Island. They tried to walk south to food and safety, but at a camp en route were halted by lead poisoning and scurvy. Those who could made it back to the ships. Two years later, a group of 30 men met the Inuit as they tried to reach help. They later died, one by one, as they walked along the south coast of the island. Then a last group of survivors were found living on a single ship, with some who'd resorted to cannibalism, exiled to a camp on shore. Finally, the last four men, still trying to make it home after six years lost in the Arctic. To actually get out and get help and reach any outpost of civilization, that's 600 miles to the nearest outpost. But they had few other options. I mean, it was either stay there or march out to help or send a party in some direction. Uh, you know, they were off the edge of any map. More than anything else, you realize that Franklin's men were still alive while search parties were, were here in the Arctic looking for them in all the wrong places. Uh, and in reality, there really wasn't much they could have done or done differently that would have saved them. The decisions that mattered had already been made. There were too many men. None of them knew how to live off the land. But for these last survivors, uh, the die is already cast. The Franklin tragedy shocked Victorian society to the core. No fabled route across the Arctic could be worth the lives of 129 men. But one young boy reading this story was transfixed. And everything about this great British disaster inspired him to try and conquer the passage for himself. it all you broke every code all the rebel to the floor you spoke the game no matter what you say but only metal what a ball If you're buying a car, you want to get the most for your money. Call the AA and you could get a low rate of just 6.2% APR typical. And with plenty of low repayment options, you can choose a monthly amount to suit your budget. So with the AA, you could afford an even better car than you thought. For a decision in minutes, call 0800 234 6000. That's 0800 234 6000 or visit the AA.com. Call now and you could also get a free six month AA car warranty. Here's a story about a mortgage advisor. She'll sit you down and ask a surprise. Yeah. With what she tells you in your mortgage.
great review. You won't believe your ears, but let me tell you it's true. Yes, you try to save your mouth. Yes, you try to save us all. When you step through our front door. When we step through your front door. Customers who have switched and saved are on average £79 a month better off with a Halifax mortgage. Make your kitchen shine with new seasons. We advocate for great stuff and we're fed up. Yes, fed up with stuff we don't like. This is what we want. Yeah! New great stuff from Asda. Healthier stuff like tuna pasta spirals with no artificial colours or preservatives. They taste great, so get some. Oh, we turn nasty. and exciting. Don't see that very often. The new Skoda Octavia VRS. Free inside tomorrow's Mail on Sunday. The epic British movie classic Zulu Dawn on DVD. Starring Peter O'Toole, Bob Hoskins, Simon Ward and Burt Lancaster. Don't miss this amazing DVD, Zulu Dawn, free inside every copy of tomorrow's Mail on Sunday. By the turn of the 20th century, the search for the Northwest Passage looked more deadly and more impossible than ever. The ice maze had defeated every challenger for 400 years, and with the loss of the Franklin expedition, had engulfed two ships and 129 men. The dream of a shortcut to Asia through the ice was now a story of disaster. And it might have been forgotten entirely, but for one man's ambition, and the extraordinary journey that would take him to the heart of the hidden Arctic world. On a summer night in 1903, a tiny fishing boat slipped unnoticed out of Oslo Harbor. The man at the helm was a 30-year-old Norwegian called Roald Amundsen. He was setting out in search of the Northwest Passage, a challenge he'd dreamt of since his childhood, when one story above all fired his imagination. Perhaps no tragedy of the polar ice has ever moved mankind as deeply as that of Sir John Franklin and his men. Strangely, it was the suffering that Sir John and his men experienced that appealed to me most. I also wanted to suffer for something. I wanted to head into the unknown. As a boy, Amazon ironically was fascinated by Franklin, this heroic failure, really. But I think in Franklin, he saw a hero. He saw the person he wanted to be. He wanted himself to suffer in the ice, to be a kind of a hero who sacrificed something to explore these extremely difficult parts of the world. The history of the earth had only these last places for a man who really wanted to do something great. The youngest of four brothers, Amundsen was born in Oslo in 1872. His father, a ship owner, died suddenly when he was 14, and in his place, Roald became the focus of his mother's ambitions. She wanted him to be a doctor, and Amundsen let her believe he would be. 
he got money from his mother to study in the university, but he never went to the university. Amundsen was a man who very early learned to hide his ambitions. And I think his own mother was the first one he betrayed. In truth, Amundsen was spending his days at the city library, poring over every account of the Franklin disaster. The more he read of the failure of this vast and lavishly supplied naval expedition, the more convinced he became that there was another way. Every day my interest grew. Night and day I dreamt of being out in the polar snow and ice. Above all, Amundsen was fascinated by the star of a new generation of polar explorers, Fritjof Nansen. Using small, expert teams, Nansen had skied across Greenland, even to within miles of the North Pole. Gone was the old idea of the siege, where you took your world with you and uh, set about defeating the place. Instead, Nansen had the approach of a modern mountaineer. You hone your techniques to absolute perfection and you remain flexible, both physically but also mentally. For Amundsen, Nansen's ideas were a revelation. Impatient to prove his own survival skills, he started training with his brother in the mountains of Norway. Inexperienced and ill-equipped, on one occasion, he took a risk too far. We had a northwest storm upon us. The only correct thing would have been to turn around, but our ski tracks were already drifted over and the weather surrounded us on all sides. That night, Amundsen and his brother dug snow holes to shelter from the storm. When the first daylight came, he discovered I was frozen in. The snow had been wet when it fell and had frozen into a compact mass around me. Only after frantic digging was he able to set me free. In the young Amundsen, in a way you see the classic young explorer. He's pitting himself against the world in this dangerously self-centered way. He sees almost a romance in the pain he's gonna experience. The Northwest Passage was now an obsession for Amundsen. At 21, when his mother died, he headed north to the Arctic Ocean. Inspired by Nansen, he was now piecing together a strategy for his assault on the most dangerous stretch of water in the world. Well, that big ships had so far not been able to get through the Northwest Passage and he knew he was going into uncharted waters. And the smaller the ship, the easier it is to handle. So when he was searching for a vessel, he wanted something which he knew was strong enough to uh, withstand considerable ice pressure, but at the same time so small that a small crew would be able to handle this vessel. Amundsen knew that Arctic seal hunters used small, shallow boats in the ice. And with his family inheritance, he bought one, a battered 30-year-old sealer called the Joa. What has not been accomplished with large vessels and brute force, I will attempt with a small vessel and patience. For Amundsen, it was the beginning of his apprenticeship learning at the feet of the one group of experts the British Navy never thought to consult, the working seamen who for generations had navigated the ice at the edge of the Arctic. He was looking for people who had an experience coping with, with ships and with ice. I think it was partly to familiarize with the nature, the landscape, the weather, everything up there. Amundsen's formula for his assault on the passage was taking shape a team of Arctic experts manning a fast, light ship. Above all, an expedition capable of adapting to whatever the elements threw at them. Amundsen was 29, unknown and untested, 
already massing debts as he now tried to raise funds for a challenge the public associated with disaster. So, sir, for, for the past centuries, navigators have found... Desperate to win the interest of potential sponsors, he told them his voyage was actually for the good of science, a quest to discover the true location of the magnetic North Pole. Believed to lie, as luck would have it, right on his path through the passage. It was a cunning route, but an expensive one. Hammondson needed a course in magnetic observation. By June 1903, his debts were spiraling. Creditors were threatening to impound the Joa. His dream, it seemed, was over. Until one last gamble occurred to him. When the creditors came looking for the Joa, they found her gone. The smallest and most ambitious assault on the Northwest Passage was on its way. Amundsen's crew of six were seasoned Arctic veterans. They were engineers, navigators, sealers. There were no scientists, not even a doctor. Academics, Amundsen believed, would undermine his leadership. He'd even won his master's license because he'd read explorers were sometimes overruled by the masters of their ships. On this voyage, Amundsen wanted total control. That morning in his cabin, he wrote, It was glorious. No anxiety, no troublesome creditors, no tedious people with foolish prophecies or sneers. The world seemed again to be full of spirit and delight. It was the 16th of June, 1903. Amundsen planned to stop in Greenland for the last of his supplies. Then 13 days sailing would bring him to the edge of the Arctic and the challenge he'd dreamt of since he was a boy. in the Arctic is under constant surveillance, tracked by satellite and reconnaissance aircraft. For modern ships, this data is a vital lifeline as they try to find their way through an ice maze that is constantly shifting with the wind and currents. We provide a daily chart of where the ice is and where we think it's going to go Every day, a ship will get a warning of what, what kind of dangerous conditions are there. We regularly issue ice warnings due to pressure or ice warning due to rapid closing of leads. Ships get stuck. Ships get stopped. 75,000 horsepower icebreakers get stuck in the ice. difficulty of Arctic navigation. It's knowing where the ice, this, this, this shifting maze matrix of ice um, is going to be at the time when I want to get my ship through. When Amundsen entered the Arctic, he had nothing but a compass, a sextant, and a half map chart. He had no communications, no means of calling for help, only the instincts and experience of seven men trying to outwit the ice. This was a group of people who realized that these environments were too big, too great, too strong to defeat. You had to use them. You had to uh, almost do a dance with these elements. And this new form of exploration is not without risks because you're very vulnerable. The Joa's journey into the ice maze brought them first to Beachy Island. 
was the site of the Franklin Expedition's first winter harbor back in 1845. For Amundsen, it was an extraordinary moment, a chance to tread in the footsteps of his childhood hero. I had the feeling I was on holy ground. I pictured the expedition in all its splendor. The English colors flying, the officers in dazzling uniforms, Sir John's clever face full of character and gentleness. He had a word for everyone and was loved by his men. But now sadness hangs over the island. From this point, the expedition passed into darkness and death. Over the course of the 1850s, more than 40 expeditions searched for the missing men. As they did so, the once blank map of the Arctic was transformed. But no one yet knew if it was possible to navigate a route from ocean to ocean. Everything now depended on the route Amundsen took from here. His research had convinced him that the key to the passage lay to the south of Beachy Island through a channel Franklin had taken, called Peel Sound. I think the ice is clear enough. Amundsen's gamble was based on something the Norwegian sealers had taught him, a quirk of the ice that might allow a small ship to succeed where Franklin's large warships had failed. A small ship? can not only squeeze between narrower leads between ice flows, but can also go in shallower areas, often where the ice recedes away from the coastline because of the heat generated by the shore. Um, there'll be a narrow lead of open water, very shallow, very treacherous, but a shallow draft ship like Amundsen had is much more likely to get through that kind of an environment than the, the big ships of Franklin's era. Amundsen was taking his men south on the very same route that led Franklin to disaster, nearly 60 years before. For the first 350 miles, the journey passed without a hitch. But then, at the tip of King William Island, Amundsen faced a choice. Franklin had turned west, right into the path of the pack ice that trapped his ships. What Franklin didn't know was that he could have turned east. Only during a search for him was it discovered that a narrow channel separated the island from the mainland. Amundsen believed that if this channel was navigable, it might be the missing link in the quest for the passage. But the search party that found it had also passed on a warning. From land, the channel looked narrow and very shallow. The waters that Amundsen was, was planning to sail into had never been charted, of course. They knew where the coastlines were, they knew where the islands were, but they didn't know where the rocks were, the submerged rocks. So sailing a ship into that is, is every mariner's nightmare. The only thing that's worse than hitting ice in a ship is hitting rocks on the bottom. And if the ice can drive you against those rocks, that's nightmare scenario. Now, as the Joa crept forward through the ice, one of their vital instruments failed. We were making our way in waters never sailed. The compass, which had gradually been losing its capacity for self-adjustment, was now useless. We were steering by the stars, like the Vikings.
Nice car, mate. Take a look at the stunning new Astra. Go drive. Having sensitive skin doesn't mean you have to miss out on life's little pleasures. New Nivea Visage Sensitive, with its active relief formula containing licorine, actively soothes and calms. New Nivea Visage Sensitive. Live life your way. I never seem to really hit it off with women. Well, you're not going to, you're looking like that. Hey, consultants, my friend really, really needs your help. Let me do the talking. Hi. Hi. Yes. Nice That's shirt, I like it. Right, well, oh dear. <sighs> Green is so not your colour. Yellow pages. Whatever you want, just yell. Some think startup. We think IPO. Some think competition. We think partnership. Some think successful business. We think wealth protection. Whatever your vision, we at Credit Suisse seek new perspectives to make it a reality. The MFI Best Sale must end on March the 8th. It's your last chance to get up to half price plus an extra 30% off everything in store. This beautiful space kitchen is amazing value at only £929, including appliances, worktops, everything. And this modern Quebec bedroom is now just £219, but only till March the 8th. Amazing prices, all backed up by the MFI price promise. The place to buy really is MFI. Yeah, so powered in a cheaper than... Actually, it's bad karma to say it out loud. Cheaper than British bus. Positive energy from Powergen. You wouldn't change the natural you for all the world. Introducing Garnier Bell Color with jojoba and wheat germ oils. It's not flat color, it's natural looking multi-tonal color that works with your hair's own tones. And grays, gone. Garnier Bell Color, color as natural as nature intended. Garnier. If you're buying a car, you want to get the most for your money. Call the AA and you could get a low rate of just 6.2% APR typical. And with plenty of low repayment options, you can choose a monthly amount to suit your budget. So with the AA, you could afford an even better car than you thought. For a decision in minutes, call 0800 234 6000. That's 0800 234 6000 or visit the AA.com. Call now and you could also get a free six month AA car warranty. Hurry down to your local Vauxhall retailer, where the Astra SXI is now available with no deposit, 0% finance and free insurance. For five weeks, Amundsen and his men had been sailing through the Arctic's labyrinth of ice and islands. The search for the Northwest Passage was now taking them deep into uncharted waters. Then one night after dinner, an incident occurred that set all their nerves on edge. I was writing in my journal when I heard something that chilled me to the bone. Fire! 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 In a moment, all hands were on deck. It's safe. It's safe. It's safe. I'm sorry. It was my fault. A fire had broken out in the engine room, right among tanks holding 2,000 gallons of petrol. We all knew what would happen if the tanks got heated. The Joa and everything on board would be blown to atoms like an exploded bomb. The fire was out before it caught, but it was a harsh reminder of how far they were from help of any kind. It was now September. The Joa had traveled 600 miles into the Arctic ice, and within weeks, the waterways would be frozen. She was still within the narrow channel to the east of King William Island, when three days after the fire, the first of the autumn storms set in. Amundsen feared most. The Joa had run aground, and her hull was splintering on the rocks. 
In the storm force winds, it was safer to ride out the battering with the sails down. But Amundsen gave an order that would turn most sailors pale. He was going to raise the sails. Right, and bring up the main! And risk losing the mast and rigging in the hope the gale would blow her off the rocks. Wind came in gusts howling through the rigging. Then we started a method of sailing that none of us is ever likely to forget. and spray washed over the vessel. The mast trembled, yet one thump, worse than ever, and we slid off. Amundsen had taken an almost suicidal risk with his ship, but as both master and commander, the decision was his. There is something disproportionate and unreasonable and unwilling to take no for an answer about him. He is as stubborn and fanatical as any of his rivals. You have to be to be his kind of polar explorer because he wants to do, in cold sober fact, what other people are quite content to dream about. They'd survived with the Joa intact. The expedition was now more than halfway across the Arctic, but winter was closing in. On the south end of King William Island, they found a sheltered bay where the Joa could be safely frozen in for the winter. They christened their new home, Joa Haven. Today, the settlement is home to more than a thousand people. Though they live in modern housing and are connected to Canada by a daily supply plane, their life on the land has changed little. For thousands of years, we survived here. We are the Igloo Society people. You have to be able to know how to uh, hunt and survive from the animals that you hunt here. You have to know the animal movement, the, the, the migration route of the caribou. You have to live with the seasons to know the dangers of the land as an Inuit. King William Island was where Franklin's men were stranded and died. The few Inuit they encountered reported that, even after five years on the ice, they couldn't build igloos or hunt seal. But even if they had, 129 men were unlikely to survive. The Inuit who came there to hunt rarely traveled in groups of more than 20. That was all the human life the island, a hundred miles across, would support. Five weeks after his arrival, Amundsen encountered Inuit hunters for the first time. Armed with a gun and two words of greeting, they approached. When they were 200 yards away, they halted. Then there flashed through my mind, heated with excitement of warfare, the word Tamar and I shouted it at the top of my voice. Tama! 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 In a moment, we flung away our rifle and hastened towards them, embracing and patting each other. It was hard to say on which side the joy was greater. You are here, live you here, live here. I need to find a place to turn this way. The next morning, when the Inuit returned to their camp, Amundsen went with them. When we came within sight of the village, the Eskimos began to shout. I could catch only one word, Kabluna. White man.
was a strange scene. I shall never forget it. Out in the desolate snow landscape, I was surrounded by a crowd of savages, staring into my face and grabbing at my clothes. I was suddenly brought face to face with a people from the Stone Age, who as yet knew no other method of making fire than rubbing two pieces of wood together. We came here with all our ingenious inventions and firearms to people who still used lances and bows and arrows. But their tools, apparently so primitive, were as well adapted to their conditions as experience and the test of many centuries could have made them. In the Victorian age, there was no use talking to the Eskimo. That didn't make you a great explorer. The Victorians wanted to prove that they were better than everyone else, that they had values to export. Perhaps it was a little bit ignoble to learn from people who ate their meat raw. In Amundsen, there was a totally different mentality. He saw the local people as people who offered the solution to that world. They belong to that landscape. There's no point in fighting it. It provides them with their food, their shelter, their medicine. It's all about seeing the place uh, simply as a home, simply as a place that offers you everything. That night, Amundsen slept inside a village's igloo. The Inuit beside him were naked, covered only by their fur skins. Outside, it was minus 10. It was his first lesson in the Inuit art of survival. In a laboratory in Toronto, the Canadian military recently used a climate chamber to test how effectively Inuit reindeer or caribou skins protected them from extreme cold. It was part of an experiment to investigate how the Inuit had adapted to the world they inhabit. They found that the caribou hair has the density and the capacity to maintain the insulation, but the, the genius part of it is they were able to find the animal with the best fur characteristics. By a process of elimination, the Inuit selected caribou. But scientists only later discovered why the fur was so effective. Air is nature's best insulator, and caribou hairs are hollow, a honeycomb of air chambers. The fur is so lightweight and heat efficient that it is yet to be matched by man-made fabrics. It's quite interesting. It's amazing. The most important human organ for thermal regulation is the brain. You adapt to your, to your environment, and that's exactly what uh, the Inuit did. Uh, they look at their environment, they look what resource was present, they use it, they adapt it, and they achieve a level of, of, of protection that even today we have difficulties to achieve. As the crew settled in for their first winter in the Arctic, Amundsen's preoccupation with the Inuit grew. To the amusement of his crew, he began to live and dress as they did. When he sweated in his old woolen clothes, they'd freeze as hard as a board. In these loose, light skins, he found he was warm and barely sweated at all. Ah, ah. Warm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was the beginning of his education by a people perfectly adapted to life on the ice.
We set about learning the art of snow hut building. Taking hold of a monster knife with both hands, we cut the ice blocks. The snow must not be too brittle, as all the blocks will crumble. The hut is built in a spiral like a beehive, so that one layer rests on the previous one and extends a little further forward. Many a snow block did I get on my head when I tried this work. We know that air is the best insulator. Snow is full of air. So if you cut blocks of snow and pile them and make a house, it provides the best insulation against the environment. It can be minus 50 degrees Celsius outside, minus 60 degrees Celsius outside. Inside it's going to be about minus five. Amazing. Mm -hmm. As the months passed, the Inuit's lessons in Arctic survival grew more and more intricate. Seal hunting begins sometime in February, when the snow falls heavily and the seal cannot hear the steps of the huntsman. They find the seal's breathing holes out on the ice, but to detect the seal, they must use an ingenious device. They take a bunch of swans down and attach a single thread to a hook with two claws. Then they lean forward, keeping their eyes riveted to the hole. As soon as the seal comes within yards of the hole, the movement of the water sets the swans down in motion. That is the signal. The Inuit were teaching Amundsen to see the Arctic with new eyes. Beneath the frozen landscape that killed Franklin and his men, there was a hidden world teeming with life. In the spring, there are fat salmon and reindeer. In the autumn, unlimited cod. And yet in this Arctic Eden, those brave travelers died of hunger. They must have stopped here and seen for miles before them the snow-covered land and no sign of life. There's not another place in the world so abandoned and bare as this in winter. Amundsen's fascination with the Inuit was increasingly proving a distraction from the purpose of the voyage. In the spring of 1904, the first signs of a thaw appeared in the bay. The ice is clearing. Oh, After six months in the Arctic, the crew were eager to resume their attempt on the passage. But Amundsen had other plans. So we uh, should be able to move on in a couple of weeks, maybe a week if we are. We're not finished here. But the ice is clearing. It may be our last chance. He realized the skills he was learning from the Inuit would give him an expertise in polar survival that few explorers could rival. Learning to master the ice and snow was becoming an obsession. The crew didn't really understand what was going on with arms. He likes more to go with the Eskimos. And then he's forgetting his crew and, and have no interest in his work. He wanted to fight against hunger, coldness, to show his greatness as a man. It's a landscape of death in a way, and he wanted to win over the death. Above all, Amundsen was now convinced that the Inuit's dogs were the key to survival. Earlier that year, during the bitterly cold weeks of March, he'd set out on a 90-mile journey to test his theory. He realizes what the key to exploration for him is going to be, and it's all going to be to do with energy. With these dogs, he could now pass quickly through the landscape. He could get away with so much more. He could choose his time, choose his moment, and pass through the landscape that much more effectively. 
but mastering the dogs and sled was far from easy. In temperatures of minus 60, Amundsen's experiment soon came to grief. The first hour, when we were all fresh, things went very well. But then the difficulties began. It seems as though we were driving the sledge through the sand of the desert. Every little snowdrift meant we had to stop. The poor dog suffered greatly. For three days, Amundsen pressed on, locked in a private battle with the terrain. Only when the dogs could go no further did he finally admit defeat, dumping half his supplies in the snow and turning for home. I now saw there was little to be gained by going on in this way and decided to turn back. The dogs soon saw which way we were going and we men were all glad we had given up our hopeless task. With the sledge lighter, we did the journey that had taken us two and a half days in just four hours. The Inuit elders, amused at Amundsen's disastrous journey, let slip the secret of the Inuit's ability to travel overland at any temperature. They coated the runners of their sleds with frozen moss, then with water warmed in the mouth, applied fine new layers of ice with a bearskin mitt. It was a surface that could run across any snow in the world. <laughs> As Amundsen's second winter in the Arctic approached, it was clear that his decision to stay was beginning to change the life of the Inuit around him. More than 60 families now traveled to join the camp beside the Joa. It was more than the land had ever supported before. There was but little doubt that our presence gave a special attraction to this spot. Many of them came to beg for food, though they have more than enough for the winter. Amundsen also learned that some of the Inuit men had bartered their wives. Though his men suspected Amundsen of having affairs of his own, he banned the relationships. Gustav Wieck wrote in his journal. The boss's mood is as sharp as a razor these days. He walks about sulking like a little child and meddles in things he preferably should stay away from. And from now on, we can expect the most peculiar plans, and heaven knows what else. Amundsen discovered that there was uh, congenital syphilis amongst some of the Inuit, which showed, of course, that, that they must have been in contact with Europeans. And there were other tensions. He uh, believed that a polar mm. expedition should be absolutely sexless. The whole concept of women uh, ought to be banished. Amundsen was an increasingly isolated figure. Though he was more focused on success than his hero Franklin had ever been, he never inspired the same easy affection and loyalty among his men. In the beginning, he needs people. He needs support. But later on, he's more and more selfish. He don't need them anymore. So he becomes more and more lonely. Amundsen's relationship with the Inuit was also growing more complicated. There were so many mouths to feed at the camp that he feared a raid on the ship's stores if the hunters returned empty-handed. There was a great number of them collected about us. We had to teach them to regard us with the greatest respect. I spoke to them about the white man's power, that we could spread destruction around us, and even at a great distance, accomplish the most extraordinary things. 
It was for them to behave properly and not to expose themselves to our terrible anger. He became a kind of a king in his crew, of course, but also with the Inuits. He made the laws. He could uh, kill a man if necessary. He was a master, the big chief, the king. Amundsen had come in search of the Northwest Passage, but in staying to learn the secrets of the Inuit, he'd brought his 20th century world to the Arctic and set in motion something that could never be reversed. They changed him. But in the same way, he understood that he was destroying their life, that he was beginning a process which is going to lead to the destruction of their culture. I believe the Eskimo, who live absolutely isolated from civilization, are the happiest, healthiest, and most honorable. My sincerest wish is that civilization may never reach them. Amundsen himself had stayed long enough to learn the skills he'd one day use to beat Captain Scott to the South Pole. Well, the shoals run across here. But ahead of him now lay the last stretch of the Northwest Passage. A single narrow channel through the ice maze was all that stood between him and the prize he'd dreamt of since he was a boy. When she got cancer, in a way, I was annoyed at her because she knows smoking's bad for her. So I bought my plot at the cemetery and they came with me to choose it. I don't care, she's my mum. I'll care for her whatever happens. She chose it, she was very brave. Broke my heart, really did. But at least I know she's got somewhere to go when I'm not here, if she just wants to talk to me. For help giving up, call 0800 169 0169. Save £300 at Curry's on this 40-inch HD-ready Samsung LCD TV, only 1399. Just one of the great savings at Curry's now. There's £100 off this compact TFT PC, only 399 our lowest ever price. Curry's, always lowering prices. You parked outside the space, sir. You can't be serious, man. Come on. You cannot be serious. It's on the line. Sorry, sir, it's out. It's in. How can you possibly call that? It's clearly in. Put the racket down, sir. Put the racket down, sir. What do you think of that? Dogs will do anything for a baker's meaty treat. A new range of meaty mouthfuls, including baker's choice chops and sizzlers. Doggy delicious. New meaty treats from bakers. Jeff, Jeff, I've got it. We'll beat your insurance deal. I'll give you 50 pounds. If it's cheaper, we'll drop our price and give you 50 pounds. Kiss. No kiss. We're so confident we'll beat your home insurance renewal, that if it's cheaper, We'll drop our price. Hello. And give you fifty pounds when you switch. <laughs> Insurance from Barclays. Now there's a thought. They call it the city that never sleeps. Yeah, right. The last flight to Heathrow. We've flown more New Yorkers than any other airline. And if we can keep them happy. Hell yeah, you will. Neil Diamond. You're gonna be okay. Twelve songs. You might get lost. But then you'll find a way. Now is the time. The most talked about Let album of the year. Finally know that I'm so on to you. All we know is that we couldn't get enough. Neil Diamond. 12 songs, out now. 
that was me a few months ago at my local NHS stop smoking service. It's a free service run by trained professionals who give you a goal to work towards. Yes. For me, getting a step-by-step -step program from experts was a lot better than quitting on my own. For details of your local service, call 0800 169 0169. You gotta go. What the hell are you talking about? You cop the feel off my mom, you gotta go. You're kicking me out? I need to ask you to leave. Get out of here. Larry, I think we're done here. Get out of here! It was a joke. Yeah, yeah okay. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. Get out right now. I'm so I'm... Security! Security! Curb from the beginning. Continues Sunday at 9.30 on More 4. The shoals run across here. How far? Um, five miles to the east and the west. And the currents are running strong. Okay, so now can we get through? During the spring of their second year, Amundsen sent a scouting party to investigate the route ahead. They reported a dangerous channel of shoals and drifting ice to the south of the island. They were just 90 miles from a charted waterway that led to the open sea. But if this channel defeated them, the dream of the Northwest Passage was over. On August the 13th, 1905, Amundsen set sail from Joa Haven down the strait that at one point narrowed to just nine miles. We call it Simpson Strait now, and it's a very, very narrow channel, and it's very, very shallow, and there's rocks sticking up all over the place. Um, it's, it's an area that modern ships just totally avoid. Stop for Amundsen to navigate through this channel, it was going one way or another, around rocks, around shallow areas, with very, very little room to maneuver. This is dangerous. This is dangerous work. Hold course! The thought that here, in these troublesome waters, we risked spoiling everything, was anything but pleasant. I couldn't get rid of the thought of returning home having failed. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. Boss! Boss! Vessel in sight! Vessel in sight! On the morning of the 26th of August, 1905, Amundsen had finally gone below to sleep when the crew sighted a vessel ahead. It was a whaler, and she was flying the stars and stripes. On her hull were painted the words San Francisco. Her captain sent over a greeting. You must be Captain Amundsen. Congratulations. The Northwest Passage was done. My boyhood dream was accomplished. A strange feeling welled up in my throat. I was somewhat overstrained and worn. It was a weakness in me, but I felt tears in my eyes. Vessel in sight. Vessel in sight. Roal Amos, that's a young boy. He's reading about Franklin, and he is saying to himself, I'm going to do this where he failed, where his men died, and I'm going to make it. For 400 years, the search for a Northwest Passage had destroyed ships and claimed the lives of hundreds of men. at last had found the fabled route across the Arctic, but it lasted only until the wind changed and the maze shifted again. As long as ice filled the channels of the Arctic, the passage they were chasing was a phantom. 
Today, a century on, a new force is at work. In the last 30 years, global warming has thinned the Arctic ice by 40%. This is what happened on one glacier in less than a decade. Scientists now predict that in 50 years' time, the Arctic will be clear of ice in summer to the North Pole. If that happens, the Northwest Passage will become a shipping highway, and the shortcut to Asia, dreamt of since the 16th century, will become a reality. But there is a stark warning for any sailors contemplating a journey into the heart of the ice maze. There's no infrastructure available to support those ships yet. No aids to navigation, uh, no search and rescue capability. And the gradually reducing ice that we talk about is not a nice, smooth thing. It's, it's very dynamic, but there's still going to be those difficult ice years, and there's going to be lots of them. It's just that more and more frequently will be the years when there is less and less ice. And that's the real danger for Arctic shipping, is that this illusion of an open Arctic channel will attract people, people who are unprepared perhaps, to go into the Arctic with ships that are not capable, times of the year when it can be dangerous to do so. Inuit, the prospect of a shipping lane through their territory is simply the latest in a long line of invasions that threaten to destroy their culture. In the century after Amundsen's triumph, numerous expeditions followed naming and mapping the Arctic, claiming sovereignty over the land and the Inuit who lived there. You know, education system came, the Hudson's Bay Company came to trade with the Inuit, no matter who they were. They all changed the Inuit way of life. As for the man who proved the passage was possible, Amundsen went on to become one of the most successful explorers of all time. The lessons he learned from the Inuit helped him conquer his biggest prize, the South Pole. Using a team of dogs, he made it on the 14th of December, 1911, five weeks ahead of Captain Scott. His success, though, came at a price. He never married. He lived alone in Norway, in a house filled with Arctic mementos. It's the biggest man in the world, a kind of an emperor of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Totally famous, but also totally alone. Feeling the coldness, the hunger, always the same men around you, make a strong impression. The ice had its price. Man is going to win over nature, but nature is also going to win over man. The ice and the snow are going inside. Nearly 20 years later, aged 55, Amundsen set out to help in the rescue of an airship missing in the Arctic. His plane vanished without trace. Just like his hero, Franklin, he disappeared into the Arctic wastes.
Nick Broomfield Week starts on Monday, documenting his return to South Africa to find former neo-Nazi leader Eugene Ter Blanche. Has prison changed his big white self? Tonight, the world's biggest penis is next. We want large numbers of men in Great Britain between the ages of 17 and 65. What a bloody nerve, I mean, who this chap think he is, you know, because mm. he's going to take England. Couldn't wait to join the Home Guard. Were they really an ill-equipped rabble? You could laugh at it now, looking back, throwing potatoes, you know. Or a highly trained guerrilla army. We had authority. If we found collaborators in any of the villages around us, to kill them. The true story of British resistance. Looking back, I think it was looked upon as a suicide mission. The Real Dad's Army, a new three-part series, Monday at 9 on 4. Oh, yeah. Definitely retired. Yeah, I'm retired. What's this about? You happy here? Yeah, very. You're needed in London this Friday. Thanks for thinking of me, but I'm just gonna have to turn this opportunity down. Do the job. No, Tom. Yes. No, yes. I'm gonna let you be happy. What should I? Are you gonna do the job? Do it. Yes, 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 yes. Where's Don Girl? Sexy Beast, the Sunday screen at 10 past 10 on more 4. now is it's pretty exciting you don't know what's gonna happen my god Daddy. why shouldn't i be interested in films you don't know what i'm interested in give me all your money oh, fucking man. I'm feeling it. We can help you to see the right person for the job. Call 0800 600 500. Booper, feel better. Batali pasta sauces, full of Italian goodness, full of taste. Please sit down. Liedam, just relax. You must resist. I will resist the mild, creamy, surprising taste. I'm so sorry. Liadama. Resistance is futile. Some think startup. We think IPO. Some think competition. We think partnership. Some think successful business. We think wealth protection. Whatever your vision, we at Credit Suisse seek new perspectives to make it a reality. We've been thinking about it. Wouldn't the world be a nicer place if more stuff was free? So when you buy any new Kia Picanto, we'll give you a whole year's insurance free. Or when you buy any new Kia Cerato, we'll give you three years interest-free finance. See? It's nicer already. Really nice free offers from Kia, the thinking person's car company.
the one that hasn't done anything wrong. It's like somebody put a giant ATM on our front lawn. If anything happens to me or my family, you'll be killed. What is the price of oil? Corruption is why we win. Syriana. Whatever your plans, you can be confident AXA can help bring them to life. Be life confident. We can help you be seen and treated as quickly as possible. Call 0800 600 500. Booper. Feel better. Free inside tomorrow's Mail on Sunday. The epic British movie classic Zulu Dawn on DVD. Starring Peter O'Toole, Bob Hoskins, Simon Ward and Burt Lancaster. Don't miss this amazing DVD, Zulu Dawn, free inside every copy of tomorrow's Made Long Sunday. 118, it's 24 7. Oh, hello, yes. Um, could you give me the number for a dog training school in Guildford, please? I'd particularly like one that does home visits. I'll text you. Oh. Text me? No, could you actually put me straight through? 118, 24 7. Whatever you want, just yell. I went to Hawaii, and the man who takes the tickets up at the top of Mount Halakamakakaya, I don't even remember what it was, he knew who I was and loved the show. You know, um, a busboy in a restaurant in New York loved the show. You know, Madeleine Albright, and, you know, loves the show. It appeals to so many people, but definitely smart people. <laughs> to be very smart and sexy and savvy to, to watch West Wing. The Hussein trial is one of the big stories making news this week. What are the others? Yeah. I'm not yeah. telling you. John Stewart is a different kind of newsreader. Who are you? You can't kill me. <laughs> I'm already dead. <laughs> An interviewer with balls. Why do you work harder than our actual president? <laughs> Do they have the license to kill, or do they take that back? <laughs> no, that's back. Um, you can get fresh. Is Kong a girl or a guy? <laughs> Settle down, Paul. <laughs> Jerry, whatever. I'll be right back. The Daily Show. All the news you'll ever need, weekdays at 8.30 on More 4. So this is it? No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yeah, huh? Oh, don't do that! What are you talking about, girls love that? Well, that's unusual. I know what we can watch next. The things you could learn from her or from any woman. Thanks for that. No problem. There's a difference between you two. One of you's bad, one of you's simple. <laughs> Unmissable comedy. Fridays from nine on four. Anal sex is, is showing that a woman is nothing. She's just um, an object that can be uh, opened up in the most degrading possible way. So that's why it's sexually exciting. That's, that's what we need to understand about pornography now, is that it's, it's about more and more outrageous and horrific forms of degradation of women. It, it's about woman hatred. Anybody who tries to say pornography and prostitution is about sex, I mean, this is an extraordinary thing. In an hour, the best of this week's last word. More for now, and it's glands down to the knees in the world's biggest penis. Rightly, you may have anticipated this program contains sexual content and nudity. I've been told by a farmer that I'm the size of a pony. Yeah, bigger is better. Oh yeah, far. Oh yeah, of course. Well, I, I, I can't get my hands all the way around the base of his penis. This is not right. Won't have no small guy. There is a uh, sense of magic when you let the beast out, so to speak. I heard, oh my god, you have torn my stuff. It looks great. I mean, you know, some cocks don't look good.
Just play nine holes then, eh? No, then this afternoon we're going to see you brief about that power of attorney. Oh, no need to do that. I've changed my mind. Michael. Well, look at me. I was right as rain. Dinner. Oh, not for me, thanks. No, no. The great god of early closing has decreed that I take Beverly out. Ashley, what about you? I'll do myself a sandwich. I'll do something proper. I said a sandwich will be fine. You know, we've got that checkup at the antenatal this afternoon. Yeah, I know you've got the checkup, but you don't need me at this one. Talk of the devil, she's at your shoulder. Charming. You've always come with me. Have you? Well, I'm taking Joshua out. I want to spend all the time I've got left with him. I should come back. See you later. I'll have to let you know. We're having a spot of bother. I need to talk with our Ashley. Well, by the looks of things, I need to talk to Claire. So, coffee's all round then? Yeah, yeah, great. Don't go too far. Right. Hey, you'll be all right. Yeah. Feeling good about yourself today, ain't you? I can see that. Oh, this is a waste of time. Well, you had a bit of a nightmare yesterday. Yeah, but I'm all right now, aren't I? That proves that whatever I had, I'm over it. It's not what the doctor said, mate. Oh, come on. She's, what, three years out of medical school? What does she know? Well, should we get your eyes tested as well while we're here? What? She knows you, Michael. She's been your doctor long enough. Yeah, but that doesn't mean the same What's as... What's her name? Huh? Your doctor, what is her name? Yeah, you're right. What's happening to me, Danny? You're not well, Mike. I mean, we'll know a little bit more once the doc gets back with the test results. But, uh, you know, she thinks you've had some sort of stroke while she was in Spain. Spain? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Spain, yeah. Yeah, that's right, you was in Spain. But, you know, Michael, a stroke is really serious. I just is supposing you had another one. Hey, it knocks you completely bandy. You can't speak, you can't write. Think of that. I mean, what's going to happen to the business? You know, who's going to write all the checks and pay the wages? Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. I suppose, say, for instance, you need treatment, right? You know, the best treatment money can buy, but you can't write the check to pay for it. And that's why you said to me yesterday, Danny, son, you better have power of attorney. You remember saying that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, you would do, wouldn't you? Because it was your idea, to be fair to you. It was a fantastic idea. So I reckon, I mean, I may be wrong, but I reckon we should just go ahead with it and do what you wanted. What do you say? Yeah. Yeah, you're completely and utterly right. Do you know what, Danny? I've always been lucky in life. And I still am, I mean, it's still rolling on, and... Do you know why? Why? Because I've got the best son in the world. Doing the best he can for his dear old dad. Thanks, Pav. I hope it does the trick. What's this? Don't say I never treat you. It's a slippery what's-it, a rude one. I thought you needed cheering up. 